Well, thanks for the opportunity to say a few words about that topic. You know, sometimes a photograph captures the essence of a subject. I think this photo from the recent 9 May Victory Day celebration portrays much regarding how Russians today think about war. Despite their fancy looking tank, it appears that these three little boys don't want anything to do with celebrating war. Most people who have experienced the horror of combat would agree with them. Maybe the father had told his little boys they were going to fight bad guys. These children may have volunteered to go for a tank ride or maybe a special operation, but have since changed their minds. Nevertheless, the father, or you might call him the president or general, looks happy and quite confident that his little soldiers will attain their objective. He appears to believe in the mission, and perhaps he's excited at the prospects of rectifying some earlier humiliation. From his garb, one might guess that he once served in the military. For some Russians, like some Americans, military service and conflict provide meaning to their life and a possible means of advancement. Some of the bystanders seem to approve of the father and his little soldiers, while others are busy with their own lives. Those that might have reservations about continuing to push the tank or sending these young men into battle appear reluctant to get involved. They probably believe they can comfortably watch this little special operation without having to pay any price. Perhaps they, perhaps they want to be deceived. As long as we don't call it a real war and the conflict doesn't touch them personally, they are content just to observe. Let me say just a few words about semantics. As you're aware, for the past seven months, Russia has not been conducting a war, but a special military operation in Ukraine. Because most Russians tend to hold a negative connotation toward the word vaina, or war, the Kremlin came up with a pleasant euphemism. If you look closely at the tank, you can see that it's decorated with the modern Russian flag as well as symbols from the Soviet period, recalling the tremendous sacrifices the Soviet Union made during the Great Patriotic War. The Soviet victory against fascist Germany has become the warped prism through which many Russians today look at the world. I say warped because for the past decade or more, the Kremlin leadership has placed greater stress on the glorious aspects of this military victory rather than on the awful cost. It has made a fetish out of the Soviet victory, not only distorting its painful history, but transforming this war into an object, object of worship. The flowers lying in the front of the tank may be a reminder of those who perished, or perhaps a symbol of future sacrifices. I could also mention the fancy facade of the tank, implying that Russian military weapons don't always work as advertised. But this isn't necessarily true. Just a couple other thoughts regarding this photo. I suspect that most fathers would stop pushing their toy tank and comfort their children if they were screaming. This doesn't appear to apply for either this father or for the current Kremlin leadership. So far, they've displayed a casual disregard both for their own military casualties and innocent civilians in Ukraine. Alas, this callous attitude is supported by a significant slice of Russian society, which not only supports the operation in Ukraine, but agrees with their president that the borders of Russia today don't necessarily align with, with the political reality. They might even support Putin's desire to show the Ukrainians who is boss in the neighborhood. Along the same lines, many in Russia today continue to assert that a young male does not become a real man until he has performed some form of military service. While it's difficult to measure the effectiveness, the notion that it is a great and glorious thing to die for your country has now become widely advertised in Russia. Over the past decade, the Kremlin leadership has worked diligently to make military service an attractive option for young Russians. One might presume that a concerned bystander could go up to the father and suggest perhaps stopping the ride or at least a change in direction. Alas, as long as the screams of the children pass by quickly or, or are muffled by other noises, few today in Russia are likely to complain, especially if the penalty for protest is losing your job, getting kicked out of school, or possible prison. Moreover, thanks to an extremely effective propaganda over the past several years, the average Russian can comfort himself with the belief that those who are fighting today in Ukraine are helping to defend the country from fascism or a NATO threat. Up until last week, there was also the assertion that those Russian soldiers fighting today in Ukraine were not forced into battle through conscription, but they had volunteered to fight. The one little soldier without a helmet appears to have his hands clutched in prayer. Over the past decade or so, there's been a much greater alignment between the Russian state and the Orthodox Church. 
While the little soldier may have some reservations about fighting and dying for a father who steals at work and drinks too much, he might find solace and inspiration in the belief that his actions will somehow be rewarded in the next world. Finally, let's reflect for a moment on how the media can shape our understanding of any given topic. I chose this image because it captures many of the points I want to focus on while discussing the questions of how Russians view war. And then I infuse this image with certain meanings, which may be true or false. There are millions of other images which would tell a different story. But like the one-sided Russian media today, I've chosen words and images which support my perspective. The Kremlin has done the same thing with their media to strengthen their story. It's up to you to determine who's telling the truth. <clears throat> Couple of caveats before I begin. First, this topic could fill a semester, so I've had to make some broad generalizations. Hopefully we can flesh out details during the QA. Second, I'm not the most qualified expert. My last visit to Russia was a decade ago, and most of my analysis is based on my contact with a few Russian comrades and the three to four hours I spend per day monitoring Russian media. Previous experiences taught me that there's a often a wide gap between any desktop analysis and reality. The situation may not be as dire as I suggest. Third, the, situ the situation today is ultra-fluid similar to giving a weather report during a hurricane. Finally, these comments are my own and do not reflect what our government or military are saying. As I used to remind my students, it's important that they investigate the sources they use. I suspect that my talk this afternoon may tell you as much about Ray Finch as it does regarding how Russians think about war. Here's an outline of my remarks. You can see Putin dressed as Nicholas I, another Russian leader who, 175 years ago, attempted to mobilize the country against a perceived Western threat. You might recall that under Nicholas I was the Tsar during the not-so-victorious <coughs> Crimean War of the 1850s. It was under Nicholas when the Kremlin coined the bumper sticker, Autocracy, Orthodoxy, and Nationality. The current Kremlin leadership has dusted off this Tsar's bumper sticker and updated it for the 21st century. Autocracy refers to the ruling elite, with its, with its implication that just like the czars and nobles of the past, the current Kremlin leadership enjoys both popular and perhaps divine sanction. Orthodoxy might refer to traditional values, or more, or more broadly, the assertion that God is on Russia's side. And nationality might refer to the notion of making Russia great again, especially after the humiliating collapse of the USSR in 91. And what better way to make Russia great again but on the field of battle? A couple of other points. Just like in the U.S., you would find a wide variance in opinion regarding how Americans view the concept of war, so too in Russia. Most of my focus will be on the attitudes of the current Kremlin leadership. It's important for us to draw a distinction between those in power and the Russian people. <clears throat> how does the current Kremlin leadership view the world? It appears to be a mixture of various theories. The prevalent view is Darwinian, where our planet is really just one large jungle filled with bestial men competing with others to protect himself and his clan and hopefully enlarge his share of the pie. In their estimation, their estimation, Russia has been, is now, and will remain a great power by virtue of its history, size, and strength, both military and otherwise. The Kremlin believes that because Russia is a great power, it can do whatever it feels necessary to protect its greatness. Similarly, due to its long history, size, plentiful resources, and military prowess, the Kremlin maintains that it is more equal than smaller states. On the global scale, according to the Darwinian model, those states with the strongest militaries and the most ruthless leadership get to make and break the rules. Another important component of the current Kremlin's worldview revolves around the notion that there's a vast Western conspiracy to weaken and harm Russia. <clears throat> Today, NATO and the U.S. are cleverly encircling an innocent Russia under the guise of democracy promotion. But really, we want to seize Russian resources. Finally, the Kremlin leadership has also sprinkled considerable holy water over its current worldview. They maintain that Russia is an exceptional country perhaps chosen by God to not only defend the world from Western vices, but to show it the proper, traditional way to live. <clears throat> now let's briefly look at some of the factors which have formed this Kremlin worldview. First and foremost, due to its geography and size, as the country expanded, Russia's borders have been increasingly difficult to defend. 
especially in the West, where, over the past few centuries, the greatest threats to Russia have come. While most Americans look at Europe as a haven of stability and liberalism, for many Russians, the West has presented a persistent threat. Whether Napoleon in the 19th, Hitler in the 20th, or maybe NATO and U.S. in the 21st century, Russians look at the West with some trepidation. This was the theme, this was the theme of Putin's remarks during the Nine Bay Victory Day celebration. The Kremlin likes to portray everything today, particularly with regard to Russia's special military operation in Ukraine, with what occurred in the Great Patriotic War. And this historical awareness has now permeated Russian consciousness. According to the Kremlin's logic, just like in 1941, Russia today is facing a consolidated fascist threat from the West. And those Western countries who dare to question the Kremlin's version of history or this narrative, whether during World War II or today in Ukraine, are labeled as Nazi sympathizers or worse. You can see the quote from Putin. Note how he stresses that, Putin, that Russia had no choice but to act preemptively against Ukraine. Putin couldn't allow a repeat of June 41 when the Nazis attacked the Soviet Union. At the top of the slide is a popular image of, a NATO, of NATO as a snake, which has now surrounded Russia. <clears throat> Besides rewriting and exploiting the history surrounding World War II, the Kremlin has also rewritten the narrative as to how and why the Soviet Union <coughs> collapsed and what occurred in Russia during the difficult decade of the 90s. Instead of seeing it as the result of a failed political and economic system, the Kremlin now emphasizes the nefarious role which the West, and the U.S. in particular, played in its demise. In the Kremlin's modern rendition, the U.S. conspired to bring down the USSR and then continued to humiliate and exploit a weakened Russia during the painful 90s. This sense of humiliation and resentment toward the U.S. formed the nucleus of the Kremlin's chronicle of recent history. Kremlin propaganda is built around the need to defend Russia from the same Western threat. These fears also serve as a justification for a stronger military and a more assertive foreign policy. According to the Kremlin's narrative, by 99, with Russia following a pro-West course, the country was on the verge of destruction. This painting by the pro-Kremlin conservative artist Ilya Glazunov captures some of the alleged Western sicknesses from that time. The title of the work says it all. Democracy, according to the Kremlin, is a clever scheme, catering to the wealthy, where it exploits the poor, trafficking upon the base urges of man, and only results in more poverty, perversion, and criminality. Many conservative Russians argue with, agree with this artist, arguing that Russia was wrong for looking to the West and liberal democracy for how to rebuild their society after the collapse of the USSR. Russia needed to re rediscover its own traditional values, where important attributes included military strength and war. <clears throat> Enough of history. Given the persistent threats and the perils of democracy as portrayed by the Kremlin, we need to ask what the Russian people want. <clears throat> On the surface, from the Russians I know, they want pretty much what Americans want. Happy family, decent job, moderate wealth, good health, meaningful life. However, given their history and the incessant Kremlin propaganda, most Russians today believe they can't have these things unless the country is very strong with a powerful leader and a formidable military. Ergo, many Russians place security and stability far above notions of democracy or personal liberties. <clears throat> many Russians like the idea of a strong leader, believing that he or she can guarantee their, de their desire for security. Here you can see some that Putin has been compared to. What does a strong leader mean in practice? First, there's no domestic opposition which can challenge the leader's right to rule. Second, the leader's legitimacy is based more on his perceived strength to defend against a foreign threat than on a popular mandate, although this is too somewhat important. Somewhat. Modern Russia calls itself a sovereign democracy, the essence of which revolves around the sovereign, that is, the Kremlin leader, having the final say as to who gets to participate in the political process. 
It's not real democracy. Now, if the primary role of the leader is to defend his people, this presupposes the need for an enemy. And given Russia's history, the West has been a favorite choice. Almost from the beginning of Putin's reign, the Kremlin has regarded the U.S. and NATO as a threat. This anti-Western militarization of Russian consciousness began to escalate as early as 2003, after the awful tragedy of Beslan. It began to take an even more aggressive turn after Putin returned to the presidency in 2012, when the defense of Russia became a key Kremlin platform. Putin and the military received a big popular boost after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. The simmering war in the Donbass over the past eight years offered the Kremlin the perfect tool to maintain and inflame, when necessary, this militarized consciousness. The Kremlin's pliant media could raise or lower the public's indignation and fear, depending on directives from above. This conflict could also serve as a smokescreen. How dare Russian people complain about oligarch corruption or the lack of genuine political representation when innocent children were being slaughtered in the Donbass? Putin's popularity, however, began to fade by 2019 when large protests occurred in Moscow and other cities after, rig after rigged elections. This was followed in 2020 when the Kremlin changed the constitution to allow Putin to remain in power until 2036. As it became clear that Putin's genuine support had started to wane, so the need to defend against an, quote, enemy became more prominent in the Kremlin's rhetoric. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the Russian Orthodox Church plays a prominent role in the current Kremlin's worldview. If the Russian military helps to defend the country against a physical attack from the West, the Church defends Russia against a spiritual onslaught. Here is a picture of the new Cathedral of the Armed Forces, which was dedicated two summers ago. I mentioned that old Kremlin bumper sticker, Autocracy, Orthodoxy, and Nationalism, which some today have translated into Patriotic Orthodoxy. This may not be a trivial point, as it suggests that some Russians today believe they are fighting for both God and country. Few young Russians may be prepared to fight and die for the corrupt Putin regime, but many more may, may be willing to fight and die for some divine promise. Allow me to explain a bit how the Kremlin has been able to exploit the Russian information space information space over the past 20 plus years to inculcate this bellicose, bellicose message. Indeed, one might argue that the most significant achievement of Putin's reign over the past 20 years has been the consolidation of major Russian media under quasi-Kremlin control. Regarding specific policies, say Ukraine, Syria, or the role of the U.S., the major Russian media all sing off the same page of music. This is especially true for Russian TV, which remains the chief conduit of information and entertainment for most Russians. This control over the media has allowed the Kremlin to portray its message in a consistent, persistent, coordinated, and largely one-sided manner. This pro-Kremlin perspective is broadcast from morning talk shows to call on radio to magazine and newspapers, evening news programs, and documentary films, which are then cut and pasted across much of the internet. It results in a 24-7, highly professional media saturation which has proven to be very effective. Unless the average Russian media consumer makes the effort, he or she has hardly ever been exposed to a perspective which deviates significantly from the approved Kremlin viewpoint. <clears throat> now that we briefly look at how the Kremlin looks at the world, some of the reasons why, how it uses the media to promulgate its message, let's briefly examine how Russians look at war. As you are aware, World War II was a nightmare for the Soviet Union, where it lost upwards of 30 million people and where the European part of Russia was heavily damaged. As I mentioned earlier, the word in Russian for war is vaina, and it has a strong negative connotation. Every Russian family I know had relatives who were either killed or injured in this conflict. The trauma of this awful war sunk deep into their consciousness. And up until quite recently, most Russians, when talking about the state of their country and the world, would remark, Lish bui net vaini, which translates roughly into, as long as there's no war. They would put up with just about anything to avoid going to war. The Soviet 10-year war in Afghanistan and the first Russian-Chechen conflict in the mid-90s appeared to strengthen this anti-war belief. 
This attitude now appears to be changing. Over the past decade of militarized propaganda, today, many Russians appear to have changed their views toward armed conflict. Some now see war as an effective policy tool and talk about the utility of armed conflict. Younger Russians have been fed with the belief that it would be a great and glorious thing to die for their country on the field of battle. <clears throat> While the Russian people may still retain some reservations about the utility of war, the Kremlin and the general staff see things differently. To repeat, in their Darwinian perspective, Russia is already at war. The Kremlin would agree with what Thucydides wrote 2,500 years ago. The strong do whatever they want, and the weak have to suck it up. Might makes right. Some in the West want to draw a clear distinction between war and peace, but the current Kremlin leadership does not see this divide. Their view holds that war is the natural state of affairs between nations, and that periods of peace are the aberration. They're at war right now, and appear determined to weaken the U.S. and modify the global security structure. From their perspective, Ukraine may be the decisive battleground. <clears throat> the Putin administration wants the Russian people to believe that their country is besieged by enemies, both from without, primarily from the West and the U.S., and within, by Western-sponsored opposition forces. According to their narrative, the Western strategy is to weaken Russia using every manner of weapon, information, economic, political, ideological, spiritual, technological, military. I can't stress this point enough. I can't stress this point enough. From the Kremlin's perspective, Russia is on the defense. It is under attack. In this slide, you can see Uncle Sam with his large sphere of influence chastising the little Russian bear for daring to draw its own sphere. A key theme in the Kremlin's narrative is the desire of the West to ensure that Russia is unable to raise up off its knees and challenge it. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, this sense of humiliation and resentment toward the West form the nucleus of how the Kremlin views the world. The failure of the West to pay due respect toward what President Putin believes are Russia's legitimate interests, for instance in Ukraine, has placed a huge chip on Russia's collective shoulder. The Kremlin and its pliant media continually assert that this is the reason why the West is responsible for all of Russia's problems. Let's take, a hand, let's take a look at a handful of possible implications from this Russian change of attitude toward war. To begin, I can't, I can't emphasize enough the deadly effects which the pervasive Kremlin propaganda has had on the Russian psyche over the past decade. President Putin's warped message regarding how the evil conniving West is trying to weaken an innocent Russia has been repeated so often over every possible medium at home, school, work, that it has now penetrated into the collective Russian bone. Like unseen radiation, this poison spread by the propagandists portrayed on the right has infected the Russian people with the belief that the West is out to harm Russia and that war with their neighbors in Ukraine is now necessary for Russia's survival. In my opinion, this is something of a novel phenomenon, what some have labeled a mental WMD, or weapon of mass destruction. Modern man has never been so constantly plugged into various forms of communication, and we don't really know the ultimate impact of this toxic information overload on human consciousness. Today, many Russians are confused, angry, and ready for a fight. <clears throat> on the other hand, up until last week, the Kremlin's social contract with the Russian people could be summed up as you stay out of politics, go ahead, enjoy your life, work, and family, and we, the government, won't demand much of you. For the past seven months, the fighting in Ukraine was mostly just unpleasant background noise for most Russians. They really weren't bothered by the minor economic disruptions, and if they watched the pro-Kremlin media while drinking a beer, it reported that all was going well with the special operation. They could direct their anger at the imaginary enemies on the TV. As Eric mentioned, this complacency has now been disturbed. President Putin's original assertion that there would be no mobilization to counter this threat has been broken, and now Russians are confronted with the very real possibility that their loved ones will be directly touched by this special operation. This could have catastrophic consequences for the Kremlin, or not. <clears throat> 
Russians are known for their patient suffering. And while many in the West want to resolve problems quickly, Russians are prepared to tighten their belts and endure a long period of time to reach their goal. What may be a beda, or a trouble, to this year, with perseverance and sacrifice, might turn out to be a pabeda, or a victory, in three to four years. If indeed the Soviet victory in World War II is the current Russian blueprint for victory, recall that it took four long years of blood, destruction, and sacrifice before the U.S. triumphed over the Nazis. The statue on the screen is the memorial at Stalingrad, or Volgograd today, where the Soviet Union lost up to a million people defending and fighting over the city. Today, some in the West are on the verge of proclaiming that Ukraine will prevail militarily, militarily over Russia. From my perspective, this may be wishful thinking. First, this conflict may grind on for a long time. Second, I fear that the ultimate future of Ukraine is more important to Russia than to either the U.S. or the E.U., and that the Kremlin is willing to sacrifice more than those in the West. I hope I'm wrong. Related to this implication is one which revolves around the notion that President Putin cannot afford to lose in Ukraine. It has become an existential fight for his right to remain Russia's leader. Now, given his control over the Russian media, he might be able to spin a victory over achieving lesser objectives, say, securing the Donbass region and a land bridge in Crimea. However, this answer is problematic for a couple of reasons. First, the Ukrainians are likely to accept this outcome, but more importantly, I don't see Putin backing down from his conviction that all of Ukraine must become a pliant state for the Kremlin. <clears throat> From my perspective, President Putin launched this war against Ukraine under false assumptions. He not only wanted to secure his place within Russian history, but apparently believed that Russians and Ukrainians were indeed one people and that most Ukrainians wanted to live and work under the Kremlin's mandate. This has proven to be false, at least for now. Un unfortunately for Russia, Ukraine, and much of the world, Putin and lots of Russians are unwilling to admit this mistake. Putin has released the dogs of war, and as of September 27, 2022, it's unclear where these dogs will bite next, or how to return them to their kennel. For those Shakespeare scholars among us, recall that the line, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war, is uttered by Mark Antony, and comes from the play Julius Caesar shortly after Caesar is assassinated by a group of senators. I know there are many in the West who believe that if Putin were removed, the war in Ukraine would be quickly resolved. Maybe, but I have my doubts. War tends to have its own unique, incomprehensible logic. The dogs of war may indeed come back and bite Putin and those around him. But unfortunately, millions of others have already been infected by the rabies of war and might end up perishing in this conflict. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to trying to answer your questions. Yes. So, um, yeah, very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you. I uh, really enjoyed it. So I have a couple of questions. One, um, about earlier points that you made, uh, mm -hmm. and the question is like you, of course, you are aware of the presence of uh, Westernizers in Russia, yeah. in the, especially yeah. in the 1990s, mm -hmm. like Zapadniki. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, what is your explanation why those Westernizers, pro-Western Russian mm -hmm. uh, intelligentsia, usually, but also others, why did they prevail in the end? Mm -hmm. That's that's one question, okay. and the second question is um, about um, you mentioned that in passing, but uh, I wanted to hear your uh, position, uh, in, you know, in greater detail. So, to what extent? So, it seems like from your presentation, it seems like Putin uses the war to stay in power mm -hmm. to an extent. So, my question is, to what extent this war and Overall, this propaganda is a way for the Russian elites, perhaps not only Putin, to stay in power, to perpetuate them, let themselves go. Yeah. 
I'm going to try the first one. Uh, why the Westerners did not prevail in Russia? You know, you know, my first visit to Russia was in 1992, and I can tell you then that I was welcomed with warmth and whatever that Russia was going to adopt a more Western model. They were excited about democracy, free markets, even though inflation was through the roof. Uh, but that was a clear direction. My short answer would be because of the tremendous economic uh, inequalities that resulted from uh, transforming that command economy into a market economy today, there was such a wide delta between the few rich and the many poor that democracy became dear democracy, shitmocracy. And people, it lost its whatever um, uh, appeal to most Russians. So that would be just short. I mean, we could go into, the, there's lots of other reasons. Putin, war and powers, were, you know, uh, I honestly think that Putin thought this was going to be a week-long war. He thought this was going to be a quick operation, have it over, like a Crimea redo. Um, and he did not plan on this. And so he made, in my estimation, his most fate, or strategic error. He, he made a, a terrible error. And he's been trying to, you know, figure out a way. And his general staff and his FSB have been lying through their teeth to him about the course of the conflict. So he's getting bad intelligence. I don't know where it will end. Uh, you know, uh, I, I do not know that. Uh, I think ultimate. Or initially, he thought it would secure his hold on power, definitely through 2036. Uh, but he made a mistake. Do you give a Yeah. Um, when I look at the the Russian um, experience. Uh, of World War II and the aftermath, etc. And then I look at the Western or the American aftermath. Uh, we had no damage to our society or to our country. We were the powerhouse. We really were um, the arsenal uh, and the banker for democracy. The Soviet Union had still had Stalin. So in other words, they were twice traumatized. Um, it would seem to me that this particular trauma is still passing through the generations. Mm -hmm. um, you say that they don't want war, and yet at the same time they glorify it. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of a schizophrenic kind yeah. of, of attitude to have? Well, schizophrenia is not unique just to Russians. No, no, no. <laughs> you brought up a good point, though. You know, World War II, to use that in a model, the, the key difference between what happened in 1941 and today is Russia was on the defense. They were literally fighting for the homeland. To, to, they're trying to now turn this into a war of defense because guess who the enemy is now? It's not the Ukrainians, it's NATO and the U.S. And they're again on the defense. But you know, from the Ukrainian perspective, the Russians are aggressors. And I think that that's hurting their morale, and for any conscious Russian person has to understand that, hey, we are wrong. The point I was trying to make with their media, they've been told something different, though. That, you know, that one of their favorite memes, just as the war started, was, where were you for the past eight years? For the past eight years, Donbass has been slaughtered, and you guys didn't do anything. And we finally had to go in there and stop this slaughter from occurring. And if you go back and listen to Putin's remarks before the invasion started, February 21st or 22nd, he talked about rectifying that, you know, just getting security over uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. He didn't talk about a lot. And so everybody, the morning of the 24th, I think, was shocked that, you know, this was now a full-scale invasion of the entire country. Had he just said, okay, I'm going to secure these separatist regions, I hate to say it, I think most of the West probably would have shrugged and said, well, you know, okay, we're going to live with that. Now it's a, you know, they would have been able to sell that. But when he went for the whole pie, I think that's what caught people, you know, unaware. But certainly from my perspective. I, I certainly didn't see it. But I didn't see Crimea in 2014 either. So there you go. Can't read the tea leaves. Eric? Oh, I was just going to, I was thinking about this, this question of the westernizers, and I think, you know, to some extent, um, some of these westernizers maybe believed in a West that was more idealistic than the West itself was. And I'm just, I was thinking, Ray, about your slides about you know, Darwinism or maybe like a Hobbesian worldview and a, uh, a conspiracy theories and you know, religion or maybe sort of the use of religious imagery to justify, justify conflict. And uh, I mean, how much of this do you see as sort of a broader populist movement? Because I was just looking at the, 
results of the Italian elections yesterday, mm -hmm. with Georgia Maloney, uh, who won. I mean, she's given speeches that sound mm -hmm. exactly like, you know, yeah. sort of the same exact sort of points, you know, the, yeah. the, the bureaucrats and what she calls the, uh, the financial speculators are out to get us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to sort of rebuild our sovereignty and, um, you know, Re, you know, reestablish religious mm -hmm. values. To what extent are these sort of global trends yeah. that Russia is sort of one, yeah. one variant of? Absolutely, and Ron, I think someone just wrote a good book about this. I just read a review. I can't remember the title of it. But I think you know, with economic uh, disparity, economic problems, mm -hmm. more immigration, a, a lot of people who are confused about gender fluidity. You know, they want to go back and say, hey, wait a minute, there's something back here that was more stable. And, and then comes the demagogue and says, yes, I'm going to go back and I'm going to bring you back and you know, we're going to make Italy great again and we're going to make Russia great again uh, and we're going to do those things. And I think it has an appeal, but I think a lot of it, I don't want to sound like a Marxist, but I think much of it stems from economic distress. And I think, you know, you talk about what's the source of terrorism, I think a lot of that is the same thing, you know, economic distress, that you know, people don't have a job, they don't have a future, that, you know, well, I'm going to fly a plane into a building. Maybe that will rectify the situation. I don't know. Yes. So, as you said, uh, most Russians uh, still get their information from the TV, which is tightly controlled. Mm -hmm. But what really matters politically in critical moments is not what Russians think, but what people in big cities think, and especially people in Moscow think, mm -hmm. as we have seen in the 90s. Because mm -hmm. probably most people in the 90s were supportive of, of Soviet Union, but they weren't asked. Events unfolded in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And in Moscow, the situation is different. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people use independent or quasi-independent sources of information. Mm -hmm. The support of war is significantly lower. So don't you think that in the critical moment that may play a big role? That it could. It could. Very good point. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I've heard people talk about the urban-rural divide in Russia and how it's, and he's absolutely right. I would say that upwards of 90, 95% of Russians are connected to the internet now. And so they have those sources, they can conceivably get it. Uh, same thing in this country, there's a lot of good sources out there, but we still have people who, uh, I won't, I won't, the, it depends on what you're eating. You know, what are you plugged into? And you can get be plugged into some sources that will tell you that black is white or white is black or I won the election. <laughs> you, you, depending on what you what you're eating, um, and so you're right. And I I don't know. Will Moscow? If if let's say there were large demonstrations, in Moscow. I think Putin has created such a police state now. The Rosgvardia is 350,000. Those guys aren't being deployed to Ukraine. They're sticking right in Moscow. And my guess is if there are large scale demonstrations in Moscow, Putin today still has the firepower to suppress it. It might change. That could change. Um, and I don't know. Very good point, though. Yes. So I, I noticed the slide about these spheres of influence that the U.S. and Russia has, and I was thinking, could that fear, could the understandable, if not justifiable, fear be there? Because the U.S. has a much larger sphere than Russia, and uh -huh. because Russia, in the last Cold War, they collapsed, and they only have what the the Soviet Socialist Republics had as their sphere, you know, Ukraine, Belarus, the mm -hmm. Caucasian states, Central Asia, whereas the US has all of, or most of Europe, they have a good amount of Asia, they have a good amount of the Middle East and Africa, and any Russian leader that does not want to be called part of the American sphere has to be terrified about that. Well, again, I, I would push back a little bit, you know, we have the United States of America here. We have a president. What happens in, let's say, France, we don't necessarily determine what, they, what they're doing. Or even in Ukraine today, we don't determine what they're doing. And so, you know, to say that, you know, that was a mean to say, hey, the United States can, and if you listen to the Kremlin, that's what they'll tell you, that Washington controls the world. There's a group of whatever rich bankers or whatever elite in, in Washington that are calling all the shots in the world. That's false. That's false. There's agency in all those countries that you just mentioned. The problem Russia has today is they have you know, a little bit of resentment after losing their empire, whether it was the Soviet or earlier the Russian Empire. And Putin is appealing to that. Putin is saying, "Hey, look at you know, um, you know, maybe we can, you know, maybe we can make Russia greater if we consume Ukraine." 
if we gob if we extend our territory a little bit. I don't think it's going to make Russia any greater. I'd like to push slightly back into okay. that with, for example, Britain. They were a great power, now they are, some would say, subservient to the United States. They and the U.S. both together in the Security Council, they were the only Security Council power to help the U.S. in the invasion of Iraq. Well, um, I agree. Yeah, we yeah. can talk about it. Iraq is another bag of worms. Uh, if, Russia worms. Wants, if a Russia, who is just fearful of the West, sees this and wants to remain independent of that, then perhaps the fear is not justifiable, but it is understandable. Yeah, no, no, I think I agree. Right. Your fears are understandable. But, and we have to try to understand those fears. And, but I don't know that we need to base our policies on those fears. We need to help, you know, perhaps educate or show that, hey, look, it, you know, we're, we're not necessarily out to weaken Russia. I don't think we are. I, I, I've, I have not come across the little black book, other than our Secretary of Defense saying we want to weaken Russia. Uh, I have not come across a little black book that says that that's part of U.S. policy. But you might be right. You might be right. Yeah, I don't. I don't claim. To. Yes. So, so what's the chance this goes nuclear? And sub question: If it does go nuclear, is Putin's propaganda machine capable of convincing Russians that it was a good idea? Yeah. Let's so take the second question first. Yes. Okay. Putin's propaganda machine will absolutely. You know, who used? Who's the only country? Which is country is only, only country has used nukes? Greatest there you go. Okay, and uh, so th they're going to even the score there. How likely is it? I think anything goes. You know, it was 1962, so that was 60 years ago in October. We came this close to tipping. I think we're going to get that close again. I hate to say it. Everything I read, because polling referendum, they just finished the referendum in these four uh, provinces and regions in Ukraine. They all voted to join Russia. Putin plans to, at the end of the month, he will accept now these as part and parcel of Russia. Now, if Ukrainian forces, using U.S. NATO weapons, start attacking those Russian territories, we've now fought, we're sending missiles and you know, rockets into Russia proper. And so Putin, you know, his conventional forces suck right now. They, they suck. And 300,000 aren't going to help him. It's more cannon fodder. Uh, I, think, I think he would be tempted to. Not as necessarily a demonstration saying, "Okay, you want to play poker? I'm, I'm going all in here." I think he, I think he would do it. You know, everyone remembers that biography of Putin that was written back in 2000 or whatever, where he recounted cornering a rat in a corner, and even though he was ten times the size of the rat, the rat attacked him. I think you corner Putin like that. I think he would. I don't think he'd think twice about using it. It was now they're defending Mother Russia. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the <laughs> economic factors and in in that how how people were so distressed and stuff by them. But I actually read where one of the reasons, and this is on the support of the war, that one of the reasons that people support Putin is that he actually kind of raised the standard on the mass of people. Absolutely. And then I had to cut out a bunch of slides as to why the Russian people love Putin. But one of them has to do with in improved living standards. The Russians I know today are living better today than they've ever lived in their lives, period. Even with the Western economic sanctions over the past seven months or the past eight years, depending on where it's coming from, their living standards are better than they've ever been. And so, you know, hey, where's the beef? And the Russians say, hey, this guy has delivered the beef. I mean, they forget that, you know, oil and gas revenues have also gone through the roof, and that's helped to pay for the, some of the Kremlin largesse. Yes, sorry. Oh, I, I guess I don't really have a question. I was in the Altar Republic of uh -huh. Russia in 18 and 19, and I wanted to say that there wasn't, talk about politics was very rare. We were oh. trying to be low key, you know. But one woman actually did say to me that it was the U.S. conniving that made this problem so we didn't happen. Yes. So that was true. That happened. <laughs> um, but also, two young men that we interacted with were wanting out of the country because they did not want to stay there with Putin in power. Mm -hmm. And so so that's going on also. Um, and the Altai yeah. Republic is in a position, in, they're, on, they're on a border where they get probably maybe as much outside news as anybody because mm -hmm. they're bordering three other countries. And so I just want to mention My that. guess is there's an exodus of young Russians, young Russian males going over that border today. Mm -hmm. uh, I will have to make an observation. I'm a cold warrior. Uh -huh. uh, I 
I was in the U.S. diplomatic service at the end of the Soviet Union, uh -huh. and I can tell you without a doubt that we did connive to destroy the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. We brought it down, and it deserved to dissolve. Um, I'm, one of my, my previous crease, or cease as it used to uh -huh. be called here, degree from KU was with the emphasis on uh, the German Democratic Republic. Mm -hmm. It's gone, and good riddance to it, mm -hmm. because it was a puppet state of the Soviet Union. We did connive, we did what we wanted to do, and that is to destroy an evil empire, which is what Reagan yeah. said, nobody liked it. But the collapse of the Soviet Union was an absolute good thing. What happened afterwards is that, as Colin Powell said, all of these former Soviet republics looked at the situation and said, we want to be part of the winning team, which is why they all asked for NATO membership. We didn't ask them to come in, they asked to come in. And so that's what Colin Powell explained to the Russians. Look, guys. They want to be part of our club. We can't keep them out if they really want to be in. Well, maybe the mistake was we should have asked Russia or done more to improve. At some point, no, we, we won't be in our never lifetime. Never have asked Russia. But at some point, <laughs> European security. Not. <laughs> at some point, European security will have to include the Russians. I hate to say it. Well, it only, it's already done. We will have to at some point, but not with a wall. At some point, you know, uh, we, we're going to have to get back around the table and talk about how we can build. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the Gorbachev idea from Lisbon to Vladivostok, a, a secure Europe or a, that includes all of Russia. Otherwise, I mean, we're talking about thermonuclear war. Well, we talk, um, again, as you said in '62, we talked about thermonuclear yeah, yeah. war too. Mm -hmm. And I predict that uh, Putin will not use okay, well, nuclear weapons, I and that if he does, he'll be assassinated. And I predicted that Putin wouldn't go into the Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> the other part about the Cold War that, that I often tell my students, I often ask the first day of class, you know, who won the Cold War? And they'd already, the United States said, well, you know, I, you know, sometimes we've got to take a longer history. I wish we could sit down and talk about maybe nobody won or we both won. Because if Mikhail Gorbachev, rest in peace, were here, he would say that we came to some sort of agreement to call it quits. And, you know, that there were some verbal promises made, unfortunately not in writing, that, hey, we, you know, we were going to try to work together. Really, not that long ago, United States military guys, we were rubbing shoulders with Russians, that we were try trying to do things. Hopefully we're going to get back to that. Um, because really, the alternative is awful. Yes. Um, I always, I always ask this class in my Cold War class, you know, when the Cold War ended. And actually, uh, historians are really, you know, most historians probably wouldn't say necessarily it ends with Soviet collapse. You know, if people would say it ended in '89, you know, with 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 the with the Accords and the withdrawal from 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 Eastern Europe. And actually, I think, you know, it's not so. It, I think there there were Americans who wanted to see the Soviet Union collapse, but the Bush administration right. until the very end wanted to keep it together because they did not want a handful Perhaps. of nuclear That's states. Right. Um, you go to Kiev in 1990, so at, right after they voted, Ukraine voted to leave. He gave his chicken Kiev speech saying, don't leave, because he was afraid for yeah, that so reason. It's, it's actually, yeah. I think it's, it's, there are a lot of contradictions there. And then there were a lot of Russians. I mean, Russia was the, was the one that wanted the Soviet Union. You know, Russian leaders wanted to cast off the rest of the republics and go their own way. Right. And central, a lot of Central Asians wanted, so I think it, it sort of changed over time. Uh, the way we think about that, right. and, and there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different perspectives. Certainly, there were you know Americans who wanted to sort of see it, see it fall right, apart. Right, 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 and right. Bush, you know, after it fell apart, he took credit. He took credit. He took credit. He took credit. That's right. he took credit um, so that also sort of changed, you know, the way the historical record is reflected. But I, I wanted to ask uh, about this nuclear thing. I hate to ask it, but I mean, if if since you do say the risk is real, you know, what? How do you think the U.S. would respond? Or what would be a what would be an adequate response to that? I and mean, I, I heard someone saying, like, oh, you know, the bomb the Black Sea Fleet or something. I mean, what, what would, how would the U.S. respond? How would that? I, I, is I, there any adequate response yeah, to that? You know, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. And those things Mr. Jake Sullivan is wrestling with right now, you know, trying to figure out you know, what should the response be. I, I do not know what the United States will do. In some days, uh, during the world, there's an article on it. So you, and towards the end, they talked about this. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, and they go back and forth, and so I think that's. I, mean, I, have, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah, no, I have no idea. I have no idea. idea. And that's, yeah. They gave you some, 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 some scenarios, and there's some pretty big foreign policy experts, and 
Maybe he read Maybe, it you know, Putin get an assassinated, we send over one of those predators, huh, John? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it will be within his inner circle and it's going to be. Oh, okay. His, uh, well, I hope you're right. The, the day of his decision. Although, as I, I said before, you know, there's no left. Democrats surrounding Putin at this point. What replaces him could be worse. We need to be careful about that. And if you go back and read Julius Caesar, you know, after they assassinated him, you know, the Republic fell into civil war. So, you know, we have to be careful what we wish for. It, they, they did, the article did mention there could be like a low grade nuclear weapon, and we wouldn't do anything. Necessarily, it's all kind of, it's all going to be rapid at point, and you let it go. Yep. Why don't people need to get to their classes? Well, let's have a round of applause. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good. 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 Good.